Hi and welcome to this screencast where we will show how to create a simple hello world kind of workflow in SciPipe. So we assume a number of things here. We assume that you have a Unix-like environment with Bash installed. So that could be Ubuntu or it, on Windows you could create one uh, using MSUS2 and on Mac OS it should also work fine. Then you need an editor. We use Visual Studio Code here with the Go plugin from Microsoft. Uh, and also you need to install, of course, the SciPipe tooling, which you can install with go get github.com slash SciPipe slash SciPipe slash dot 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 to get all the sub packages. So the dot 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 is important. Uh, we have already done that. So before we go into the screencast, I want to mention that there is uh, a really one really easy way to create a new workflow in SciPipe, and that is uh, to use the SciPipe new command followed by a go file name. So if we do that, SciPipe new example dot go, and we check our files, then we see that we have a file here uh, with a simple workflow. So in that uh, way, you can get uh, something to start from so that you don't need to remember all the syntax and then you can modify it and so on. But now uh, in order to uh, demonstrate and learn a little bit let's create the workflow from scratch instead. Uh, so to do that in Visual Studio Code we create a new file and let's call it myworkflow.go and as you might notice, uh, workflow code in SciPipe is just normal Go code. And in Go, if you want to create a file that is runnable as a script or as a program, you need to call it package main, or it needs to have a package main. Then it also needs to have a main function, which is the function that will run when, when you run the program. And then since we're doing uh, SciPipe stuff here, we need to import uh, SciPipe. Uh, so when to create a workflow, the first thing we need to do is to create a workflow object, or actually in Go terms is a struct, but it's basically a similar thing. So we do that by calling SciPipe.newWorkflow. And here in uh, Visual Studio Code, we get rather good uh, documentation that tells what parameters we need to supply. We need to give a name for the workflow and then the maximum number of concurrent tasks, which should be the same as our virtual cores on the computer, typically. So let's call this my workflow. And I have four virtual cores on my laptop. Uh, and then we need to create the first process that does something. And uh, for demonstrating something, let's uh, create something simple, such as uh, a process that just writes a few letters of DNA to a file. So we could create a process called DNA Writer. And uh, to create it, we use the workflow struct and then use new proc. We give a name to it and we'll call it DNA Writer. And then as you see here, we're supposed to supply a command pattern. And here is where some of the magic happens. So we use the bash echo command uh, and we write some DNA letters. A, C, G, T, T, C, G, A. And now we could write that to a file called dna.txt with an explicit file name like this, but to make SciPipe know that this is an out file, uh, which actually could have different names sometimes based on different parameters or input files or whatever, uh, we instead use this special placeholder pattern with curly braces and O colon for an out port or an output, uh, and then we give a name for this out port. So in, we call it DNA. Uh, and then actually this is all that we need to to run this workflow 
we could just do workflow.run here and then if we don't have if we don't use this variable we, we need to then remove it actually if we just want it to run like this if we don't like access it in any way so we could try that actually uh, go run my workflow and yes it executes something but now we haven't told uh, what name to use for this output so it will just name the file based on the name of the process and the output so the output to this process will be dna writer dna if we check it uh, so if we want to give it a name we go back and do like we did first we create a variable to hold this struct uh, let's create it let's name it writer just like before dna writer and then we have a special method called set out which takes the name of an output which is dna in this case just like here and then it provides uh, it takes a pattern for the output and then we can call it dna.text so if we do it like that and if we remove those files and do go run uh, sorry we need to actually save the file as well go run now we see that it has written it to dna.txt uh, like this and now let's remove some dna stuff here right but any a workflow isn't really a workflow unless there's at least two process in it, processes in it right so uh, we let's come up with some kind of process that we can that can work on the output of this first process and do something with it so one thing we can do since this is dna letters and you might remember that dna letters in the double helix and um, spiral contains consists of pairs of bases where there's one base and its complement so a is complement to d t c is complement to g etc so we could actually create the complement of this string the string that would be, reside on the other side of the strand <clears throat> so to do that we can create a complementer in a similar fashion. New prop complementor. And to work on an input file, we, we create an import, which we'll call DNA, by just reading it up from, from a file, and then piping that to the tr command, which can take a sequence of letters and then provide an equally long sequence of letters um, that these letters individually should be translated to. So A should be translated to T, C to G, G to C, and T to A. And then we write that out to something called a compo. Right, and then we want to give a good name, file name for this out for the output of this one, for the complemented output as well. So we do that again with the set out process and we reference the out port name here again and a compo and then then we provide a pattern pattern here so you see we have some some uh, documentation there but uh, in simple terms what we want to do we want to base the input or the file name on the input file name here since we might use we might use this process and connect it maybe to other processes or different processes depending on what we want to do so <clears throat> it's good if we can base the file name on on the input and just pad on some extra string or something so let's reuse uh, the input of this one s s uh, given that we assuming that we want to connect this later so we refer to the import name here that we will use 
DNA and then we add compo.text. Now of course we need to co connect these two processes. Complementer. And to do that we first refer to this import uh, called DNA by the import accessor method in. Then, then we have this import object here. And on that one we can use the from method which takes an outport. And how to get the outport of this DNA write the one uh, process named DNA. We use the DNA writer object and then use the out output accessor and supply it with the name of that outport. So now we have connected the workflow. Now let's just check that we don't have any extra stuff there and go run my workflow. Yes, and now we see the DNA writer is first executed and the complementer. Uh, and if we check the output, DNA.text starts with A and DNA.text.complement. That one contains the complement complementary basis of the first string. So uh, we can show just one more trick here if we remove these DNA files. Like now you maybe saw that we got double text dot text strings because we have DNA dot text and then which we reuse here and then we add compil dot text again. So we can actually remove this text part here by using a modifier which is available in SciPipe. Sorry. Uh, which is similar to one that exists in Bash. <clears throat> the only difference is in, in um, SciPipe you have to add the pipe before any modifiers. And then the percent sign followed by a string will remove this string from the end of the input from the string coming from the import here. So now we should not get double occurrences of dot text. Let's say, save this and go run. Now if we list the files, you see that we have dna.txt and dna.compl.txt. And um, if we check the those audit files as well, because those are quite interesting, then we have a JSON file with some information about how this corresponding file was created. We have the command. Created and sign is replaced by something that is safe for JSON. We have some execution time stuff and what output files it created. Uh, but especially interesting is if we look at this um, second file, because that one contains the command to create that second file. But for this input file called dna.txt, we can under the upstream uh, section here, we can and under this, uh, the name of the fi this file, we find this uh, the output or the log file information for that uh, command as well. How to create how that file was created. So it's a hierarchical structure that contains all the information about how this file was created. And there's actually one really cool thing we can do with this. Uh, if we remove like everything ending with dot text and we can uh, actually remove the first audit log as well and then uh, sorry if we take this second JSON file and we use SciPipe's audit to bash command then we get a bash file here uh, we can look at it in the editor here. Sorry, there we go. Uh, we get the bash file, which can actually reproduce the whole workflow that we that we ran to to create this second file. So if we try it, 
bash and run this. You see that we don't have any .txt files here, only these audit files. So if we run it, it creates this file again. DNA.txt and DNA.compl.txt. And we can check the content of them. And it works. Um, there is uh, we can also add it to. We can also create an HTML report if we want. And then we get an HTML file that we can check in the browser. We'll open it up in Chromium. Uh, sorry, like that. Uh, and then we have an HTML report of the output with the first uh, command that was run and the second one. And you notice here the that dot dot slash, that's just because uh, each command is run in a subfolder in the current folder, a temporary subfolder. So to refer to existing files, it needs to use dot dot slash. New files are created inside that temporary folder before they are automatically moved out to their final positions by SciPy. So that's about it. That's uh, how to create a simple workflow in SciPy. And we also showed how to use some of the tools that can work on the audit log that is created by SciPy.